Hi, my name is Dr. Bruce Baird, and you're watching The Best Practices Show. Hey guys, thanks for watching the Best Practices Show. We take a look at the best business practices from the best dental practices all over the world. And if you're a dentist trying to grow your practice, I know you're thinking about a lot of different things and how to increase your productivity, and it can make you crazy. And today I've got one of the experts on how to truly grow your practice, be more productive without speeding up and making it all about how fast you can go with Dr. Bruce Baird. You do not want to miss this. So do me a favor, stick around, grab a pen and hit the share button. You're going to love this. Now, couple show notes. We are shooting this live on Facebook. So as you're watching it, if you have questions, feel free to add them to the feed. And I'll ask Bruce directly while we have them on, because I want you to get the most out of this. And if you're watching later on too, continue to add questions to the feed again, just because while you're here with us, we want to make sure you get the most out of us. And uh, again, always grateful for the shares, the suggestions. Right now we're up over 39,000 followers on Facebook. Over 150,000 of you have visited us, visit us on iTunes and I don't even know how that works, but all I can say is thank you. Now, my guest today is Dr. Bruce Baird. Now, Bruce, I've been tracking you for a while. I get a chance to see you speak every once in a while. You're out there in the lecture circuit. You've been teaching dentists for a long time uh, how to be more productive. And I know who you are. I've been watching yourself. But if somebody's watching this and they're a young dentist in dental school or haven't heard about you, can you just tell them a little bit about who you are, your story, and what, what it is that you do? Sure, Kirk. I'm, you know, I've been a dentist now 38 years. It's flown by fairly quickly. Uh, so, uh, and I spent four years in the in the service. I was in the army. I was a dentist. Uh, and when I got out, I've been in a big, thriving metropolis of Granbury, Texas, for the last uh, 34 years. Six thousand people in the town. Our average new patient comes from 70 miles away. And, uh, you know, and productivity, what I've learned over the years, productivity is really not about speed. It's about good communication and good, there, there's, there's some real keys to how to be more productive, but I've been doing it. I, um, I enjoy teaching. I enjoy working with dentists. Uh, dentistry is tough and you know, it's hard and you, you're working four and a half days a week and, or five days a week and you're busting it and you run behind in your schedule. Stress is high. You're maybe not making what you think you really should be making. And those are all the things that we address because there's nothing like reducing stress, increasing productivity, uh, and having more time to do the things that you love to do. And maybe that's dentistry. Maybe it's playing golf. Maybe it's, uh, you know, spending more time with the kids, whatever it is, but it's, it's, you don't have to, uh, run behind and be stressed all day long. It, it literally, there, there are ways to not do that. And so that's really what we teach. And yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. And I love how you have it all this laid out and we're going to talk about, we're going to go through each one of them, but let's talk about the why before the how, why is this so important for it? Because you, you know, you've been doing this a long time. You look at all the algorithms. You've watched a lot of people build their practices. Some dentists are losing their minds. They're working Saturdays and Sundays, full days. Why is this so important to figure out the productivity thing? Well, really, I mean, when you look at, you know, they always ask the questions, do you like what you do? You know, in dentistry, it's a, it's a tough one, you know, because there's a lot of dentists that aren't happy, you know, with what they're doing. They, they end up signing up for all the, the managed care plans and all the PPOs and everything else. They're working faster. They're having to work 400% harder to make the same amount of money, but they think that that's what they need to do. And to me, if I can help dentists create a, a better life, a better lifestyle, uh, you know, money is not the most important thing, but I tell you, it, uh, it, 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 it helps, uh, give you choices. And so, uh, and that's what we do. You know, we'll take practices that are doing 600,000, five, six, seven hundred thousand $700,000 a year and four or five years, they're doing 3.2. Mm -hmm. So it's, and without the stress and instead of working four and a half days, they might be working three days. We help them bring in associates, but it, it, to me, uh, 
I was very frustrated in my practice, uh, 34 years doing it. I was probably the worst boss on the planet, uh, grew up, I'm the son of a Marine aviator. So the, uh, your little imitation of uh, Jack Nicholson, that was probably my dad. <laughs> and, uh, so I, uh, you know, I didn't communicate real well, but God has a sense of humor. He gave me four daughters. Mm -hmm. And so I had to learn to speak a different language. And, and when I did, I started having a team that I got along with, had fun with my patients, uh, you know, having more of a relationship with them instead of just zipping in and zipping out. I just changed the way I did things. And by doing that, uh, I've been working two days a week for the last 14 years, but I'm, I'm more productive in two days than I used to be in five. So it's, uh, by doing that and working and helping Dennis, that's the why for me. I just, I just get a, it's a blast, uh, to watch Dennis. And we work with Dennis that are just coming out of school, uh, dental students all the way to guys that are old like me and, uh, that maybe didn't put away some cash. And now they, now they want to be productive all of a sudden. So mm -hmm. but what's funny is it's really just intuitive stuff. It's, there's no, there's no silver bullet. There's no secret. Uh, I always see all the stuff on online. I oh, get the secret to this or the secret to that. There's no real secret. It's just we try to do things in a systematic way to help Dennis, and uh, and we've been real successful doing it. And and it's been, I mean, it's been awesome. I've enjoyed it. That's great. That's great. And so um, we're going to go through this now. If I'm a young dentist, I'm 32 and I'm watching. This, I'm like Bruce. I'm working five days a week. Like I would love that. And you, you, you and I were talking about this before we went live. There's really four kind of critical steps. Like, like you said, it's nothing new, but once you get these down, it adds to productivity naturally. So take us through this. Where do I start? You know, what I always tell folks is it, it really about the comprehensive exam. I mean, it's really doing a comprehensive exam and having, uh, having the verbal skills, to feel comfortable sitting down with a patient and talking to him as a consultant or as somebody they came to see you. I, the, dentistry has really gotten into this deal where it's the crown of the year club. You know, my insurance covers one crown. 95% of all crowns are done one at a time. Why is that? None of us would have, uh, if we had five crowns that needed to be done, none of us would do that over five years. We'd want to do it as quickly as we can. So, um, and, and so dentists just get locked in because of insurance or whatever, but communication skills to me is number one. And I speaking, you know, speaking just a few minutes ago about it, you know, growing up, you know, with, with the Marine, you know, the Marine background is, is my way of the highway. And then with, with the daughters, I had to start to learn to communicate better with my team, uh, learning to communicate with my patients because I would run behind all day long, catch up, you know, I, I, I'd catch up at the end of the day. And that's, you know, it's just all day long. My, my introduction to the patient was usually, hi, my name is Dr. Baird. I'm sorry. I'm running behind. That was my lead in on every single patient. And it was like ridiculous. And I, I, after seven years in private practice, I, you know, I wanted to, you know, I, I was getting burned out. Uh, I was seeing 250, 300 new patients a month, which was a full mouth exam was a mouth mirror. I mean, it was like, you know, it, I wanted it to be a special experience to come to our office, but it, it wasn't because there were just so many patients and, and stress levels were super high. But from a communication standpoint, when I learned to sit down and, and not talk about, you know, walk in the room and go, how can I help you? No, I walk in and go, hi, Bruce Beard. You know, how long have you lived in Granbury? You know, and so we start talking off the you know, off the subject of teeth and, you know, where'd you grow up? And they'll say, oh, I grew up in Richmond, Virginia. And I go, Oh well, man, that's awesome. I said, my family, I've got family from Richmond whatever it is, it says, you know, I, I call it linking. I mm -hmm. want it to be, uh, I want it to be, uh, uh, you know, a links. I try to get three links to a chain that can't be broken. And when I say that, I want to find out three things that we have in common together. Maybe that we play golf. You're, you're using tailor-made driver or whatever it is. Or I look at your address and I know where you live in town. You, know, you live close to a friend of mine. Oh, I know them. So I'm trying to find common ground with my patients. I do the same thing with everybody I meet. I you know, want to find things that you know are, are interesting about them and how we communicate together. And it changes the conversation because the patient, you can just see, they start to become more relaxed and they start to, and then when I say, how can I help you? It's literally, they're going, well, Bruce, you know, I'd like to, I really was thinking about my smile and, you know, they'll tell you 10 times more than if I just walked in, stuck a mirror in your mouth and said, well, it looks like you need to have a crown done. So it's more about uh, kind of an overall 
overall uh, looking at the mouth as as a as a whole and just saying, you know, let's take a look. If it's okay with you, and I and I say this every time, I say I could have ten of my dentist buddies come in and we could probably give you fifteen different opinions. And I said, but here's the thing: what I what I'm going to recommend, if it's okay with you, I'll just tell you kind of what I would do if it was me. Now it doesn't mean it's the only way to do it, but. It, you know, that's, that's what I'd rec- you know, recommend. They go, oh, yeah, I've never had anybody say, no, don't do that. And so I said, okay, well, let's just take a look. And then we have a conversation. I set them up and we talk about the, the dentistry that needs to be done. But it's really about those communication skills and being able to, to get on the same page with a patient. People won't buy from you if they don't trust you. And if you just walk in and you just go straight to the mouth and straight to the bottom line, and what I tell dentists all the time is just smile, you know, just mm-hmm. smile more, you know, yes, this is very interesting, but I was in Granbury, Texas. And when I first opened my practice, we had a nuclear power plant about eight miles down the road. Well, all of these patients were engineers, you know, they wanted to know the molecular structure of titanium. They wanted to know what kind of metal you're using in these grounds. They're going, I don't know. It's, you know, it's good metal. Don't worry about it. You know, but an engineer has to have every thing answered before they can make a decision. And it was so frustrating for me because I'm, I'm an engineer when I'm designing cases, but I'm not an engineer when I'm visiting with people, when I'm talking to people, you know? And so I'll walk in, my, my team will come in, they go, we got an engineer. We only have two types of people in the world, engineer, non-engineer. And if it's a non-engineer, I just go in, uh, you know, I might walk in and high five. I've, I heard them, their voice and I might come in and go, Hey, Bruce Beard, so nice to meet you. And but that's very different when I go into an engineer because I'm got my eyebrows. I'm like, hi, Bruce Baird, you know, and, you know, I understand you work out at the nuclear plant or you, you know, whatever. And so I try to accommodate those different things. So I had to learn to speak engineer language. The frustrating thing for dentists, most dentists are engineers. I mean, we learn, we like to tinker with little things. And, and so we want to show you everything and we want to make sure you see it. Whereas probably 80% of your patients are not engineers. They don't need to know all the details. You don't have to have full mounted models with, uh, you know, Facebook transfer in order to sell a case. All you have to do is communicate with them, get on the same page. They, they, once they like you, once they trust you, that what, what you recommend, if they could afford it, they're going to do it. If they can't afford it, we come up with a potentially another another game plan for them. But usually it's always working towards optimal dentistry. You know, that's the way, the way we looked at it. So, yeah, this is great. And now I love where you start with this communication in communication, but you get to see dentists all the time. Sometimes people skip over this one and go, oh, I'm a great communicator. Do you ever stop learning how to be a better communicator? I don't. I mean, I'm, I spend every, I mean, how, how do I, if I feel uncomfortable, you know, there's something wrong. And so I, I will walk out of the room, you know, I'm going like, man, this is a tough one. I've got to go back in. I got to be on my top of my game here, you know, because uh, some folks it's hard to communicate with. I mean, they walk in, they got their arms crossed, their wife made them the appointment. They don't want to be there. They're just like, they're generally pissed off and they're just sitting there and I'm like, okay, you know, and, and so I'll just start talking to them about their set, the cell, uh, where they live, where they grew up. And pretty soon they're relaxed. And, uh, but you're always learning. You're always learning. And I'll try new little ways of describing things, you know, in sizal edge composites, you know, I tell people it's kind of like an M&M. If you turned it on its side and you started shaving the top, you'd have a hard outside and a soft inside. And that's what's happened on these lower. And they go, oh, okay, yeah. And we can fill that with something that's acid resistant. And patient goes, oh, that'd be cool. So it's, you never, you're never going to stop learning. I hope I don't stop learning, uh, you know, how to communicate. So it's, it's, it's what I enjoy doing. It's what I love about dentistry. Uh, it's what I hated about dentistry when I first started, but it's now something that I absolutely love. So uh, getting to meet new people, getting to help them, getting to fix their mouth, uh, get them healthy, uh, get a great smile. Those are all things that just are make, make dentistry so much fun. Even after 38 years, it's it's still a blast. I still enjoy it. So yeah, Absolutely. And you look at the balance of CE out there. There's that, dentists don't really take communication classes. First of all, there's not a lot of off offered out there either in dental school or postgraduate and then of all the course selections they would want it they'd rather go to a bonding course or something else like that right yep it's it is and the problem is and the most frustrating dentist uh, that, that i see the most frustrated is when they've gone to panky or they've gone to john coist or frank spear or they've gone to these series of courses they're now a mentor or the the grand poobah guy for whatever 
courses that he went to, but they come back and they, they're not getting to do it. They're not getting to do the dentistry, even though they know how to do it because they don't have the patience uh, or they're not communicating with the patients uh, to do it. And that's frustrating. You know, you spent all this money. How do you get more people to do more dentistry? Well, you, you learn to communicate with them. Once you have the skills, that's great. But the communication part is is paramount if you if you're wanting to do the dentistry. And I see it, man, all the time. Dentists, you know, they're doing three hundred and five dollars an hour, uh, three fifty an hour, whatever it is. The average dentist in the U.S. is doing four hundred five, but they're doing three hundred and fifty an hour, and literally have the experience of. I mean, they can do full mouth rehabs, they can do implants, they can do all this stuff, and they're doing three hundred and something an hour, four hundred an hour. That's that's not doing dentistry. I mean, literally, that's maybe three crowns a day, but that's the average dentist out there. They're frustrated. And uh, what we try to do is take that frustration, take that stress off the table, teach them good communication skills, and then and we work forward from there. And as they begin to communicate better, we go through an entire exam process with them. This is how we do it. It's not the only way to do it, but it's the way we do it. And, and I'm able to be really productive doing it. We've been teaching it now for... 15 years uh, on how to do that. Dentists will increase their productivity from 350 to 650 in a matter of in a matter of a month or two months. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Well, that means an additional five hundred thousand dollars in their practice. Well, now you start to make choices. You know, most dentists don't market. You mm -hmm. know, they're not marketing. They're not doing anything. They, you know, and, and so what we do is we we systematically first get them where they're communicating doing comprehensive exams looking at risk factors with patients and then we take the next step which is now let's start to market towards patients that need the services that you want to do i always tell tell folks i mean most of us and i'm i'm guilty of this also we do a comprehensive exam on everybody but a lot of docs haven't done that they've just been doing one crown at, at a time and so they have all these patients in hygiene that really, I tell them, let's have, let's pretend they're a new patient. You know, let's pretend they're a new patient because I haven't done an FMX on them in 12 years. I mean, I haven't really done anything. They've been coming in for their cleanings fairly regular. So what I'll go in, I'll say, hey, Kirk, you know, I've been we've been watching a lot of this stuff for a long time. Why don't we do this? I'd, I'd really like to get some individual x-rays and let's set up a time where you and I can just, you know, visit about it because I, I think you can see things. And they'll go, absolutely, that sounds great. I already have a relationship with those people, so it's easy. It's not a new patient, but I can now begin to function at, with a new system on how to do the exam. You know, lean the patient back, set them up, go through it. And so that's what we teach at PDA. And, and increasing productivity gives you choices. And by having choices, we talked a little bit about it's not about speed. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, if $405 an hour is the average dentist in the U.S., times eight hours, that's 3,200 bucks a day. Mm -hmm. Well, that's like four crowns. Well, most dentists could do four crowns by 9.30 or 10 o'clock in the morning and then have a tea time at 10.30. I don't know what they're doing the rest of the time. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think it's just busy work and it's just not being productive. And so it's really not about how fast you cut the cram prep. It's just having more cram preps to do and having more dentistry to do, more, you know, whatever it is. And the more you see, the more you learn and get educated the more you know and the more you'll see when you look into the mouth you're saying okay well i can help you with this maybe do some crown lengthening or do whatever but i think really it all it all starts with that relationship and once patients are comfortable with you i mean i can get comfortable with an engineer i can get comfortable with a non-engineer but i have to speak a little different language uh i had i had a, i was with in front of a big group this is back in the late 80s there was like you know gosh I, there was probably 300 people it was up in newark and I was telling them about how to match and mirror and how to, you know, when you're talking to people, if they're talking fast, you talk fast. If they're talking, I, I tend to break into accents all the time when I'm talking to somebody. My team cracks up. And, but, but somebody in the front row said, that's a bunch of crap. You know, that's a bunch of crap. He said, you're being fake. And I said, well, there were three people there. And I said, well, let's say you speak French, you speak German, and you speak Italian. And none of you guys speak English. I got to learn how to speak French, German, and Italian to you. Because if I don't, you're not going to get what I'm trying to, to share with you. And you came to me, hopefully, to find out what to do with your mouth. And so we market for train wrecks. I like that. Uh, and we get them. And so that's, uh, that's what we do. But it's all about, again, all about communication to me.
Yeah. Now I want to go back because this is really good. You have been a big proponent of just really understanding what it means per hour. Now, a lot of times dentists look at production, it's a tally at the end of the month and they go, oh man, we didn't do any better. I want you to talk about that because it's really an important metric is to know how much you produce per hour, right? It is. It is for... It is for me, and people joke about it. They said, probably, you know, how much it costs you if you go to the bathroom. And I, I mean, I, I don't break it down into minutes, but, you know, production per hour is a good benchmark uh, when I start looking at that. And because we can see improvement, I mean, most dentists, you know, they've done 600 an hour, 800 an hour, whatever it is, but they just did it one month. And I wrote a series of articles in Dental Economics. It was called the Dental Roller Coaster. I mean, most dentists, I mean, it's this month I'm rich, next month I'm poor, this month I'm rich. When I'm rich, I spend it. You know, when I'm poor, I get stressed. And so, you know, you do a bunch of crown and bridge, you have a good month. The next month is when all the bills from the lab come in. Now you're going, oh, crap. Now I already spent that. So it's it's a very, very up and down, up and down. What we teach is I want it to be steady. I want my production to be steady. Uh, I want, I set my goal beginning of the month. Uh, and I say, this is what I'm doing. And if I'm only working and I've been fortunate to only work two days a week for the last you know, 14 years, but my two days are, I'm, I'm intense. Now, if I'm going to be gone for a week or two weeks, I'm still going to be productive at my level. So if I tell the practice I'm doing 180 or 150 a month, I'm going to do, I'm going to do that. Uh, I just start preloading my schedule. Like I'm going to be on vacation in August. Okay. I got some real good cases here. I'm going to put them into August because I know I'm going to be gone for some time. So I increase that productivity and I, and then we hit it. So we, we can predictive, uh, predictively determine what we can spend. And if we know we're going to produce it. And so healthy new patient flow, comprehensive exams, uh, not everybody's going to do the dentistry. You know, mm-hmm. not every single patient is going to do it. But if you have a healthy new patient flow that are coming in uh, and you're doing the same type of exam, the same communication skills, what you find is you start doing a lot more dentistry. And it happens very quickly. It's uh, it's interesting. We see docs that go up, you know, 500, 800 an hour. And it just gives them amazing confidence. And they, you know, we've had docs that were in a trailer, you know, in a in a single wide trailer now that are in brand new facilities with an associate. And instead of doing 600 or 700,000, they're now doing, you know, let's say 3 million or whatever. And it's not about the money. You're actually getting to help more people than you were before because it's frustrating. If you're just sitting around on dental town all day, you know, that's fine, but you ain't making no money. I mean, you're, you know, that's, that's not where it's happening. So, uh, we work, you know, we work with dentists in that in that productivity realm, uh, but it's really about relationships. If my production goes down, interestingly enough, I, I I think about my new patients and I go, do I really know who they were this week? In other words, or was I just going through the motions? Were they just walking in? Because I want to I want to work on friends. I want to know who they are. I want to find out about them. So when I come in next time, I'm going, hey, how was the cruise or how was the whatever. That's, I just want it to be more about relationship-based productivity. And the better relationships you have, the more production. So I go back and look, you know, if, if production is down, it's not my team didn't do something or anything else. It's usually me. Um, you know, I'm just going through the motions. We, we, we do what's called risk factors. John Coyce started out with, uh, you know, you have periodontal risk, you have, you know, biomechanical risk, you have functional risk, you have aesthetic risk. I added two more. I added physiologic risk for sleep apnea. And psychological risk, because I want to find out if this patient's psycho before I start working on it. You know? So we're going we're gonna to go through those risk factors. And as I go through them with them, patients understand now that their mouth is, you know, they, they understand they have treatment. You know, yes, you've had gum problems, but let's solve that. Let You have decay issues. Well, you know, you're drinking 15 Dr. Peppers a day. Now, let's talk about that. And, you know, if you want to have dentistry done, we're going to have to stop doing that or my dentistry is going to fail. So I, I put a lot. I put a lot on those risk factors and that's part of my exam that I go through. So that's, what yeah, that's great. That's great. Now you and I talked about the, of the four keys here, you mentioned communication skills. What's number two in increasing your productivity? You know, you can cause say service mix where you're, you know, you look at what kind of treatment you're doing. Uh, Cause once you can communicate and do a complete exam, now is when you can use the, the COIS, uh, all the COIS education and training, all the SPEAR education, training, whoever you're going to, whoever is your mentor, you know, implant stuff with MISH or wherever it is, now you can actually start to 
do more dentistry uh, because you're communicating well. So service mix is important. It's not, you don't have to have tons of technology to be productive. You don't have to spend, you know, you don't have to have CAD cam. You don't have to have a, a cone beam. You don't have to. I have all of them because I can't, I can, I can have them because we're productive, but you don't have to have that to start with. You can take a, just a general practice, start to become more productive just by learning, you know, use the skills that you have, good communication skills. And then it comes down to marketing for those people that need whatever dentistry you want to do. Um, yeah. uh, Periolase might be a good example. We, I've been using the Periolase for 17 years. We do Lanap surgery using the laser. Um, so I market to people who have gum disease and tell them about the laser on, on, on our, through our marketing. And so we have people that come from all over and they come in. I heard you have a laser and that's, so I'm marketing to people that need the services that I want to do and which is a big deal. That's a big yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And I'm sure you get these questions. I get them too. You get a young dentist and you talk about service mix. Sometimes they're trying to do way too much or something like where do you, where, what would you say to a young kid who's just trying to do everything or they want to specialize? I mean, do you have a, do you have a certain thought process in that? Yeah. You know, it's, you can be all over the map and I, right. I do like, I do like, you know, I'll see people go to manufacturer's courses. Oh, I went and learned how to do endo using this, or I went to go do this and a lot of manufacturer type courses. I really like courses that are set up like a John Coises, you know, where you go through, you're going to learn occlusion, you're going to learn risk factors. You're going to go through that. Frank Spear does this, does the same thing. You know, Panky has a series of courses that you go through. So you got to miss your, or the implant guys, they, you know, step one, step two, step three. So I really recommend if, if, if I'm, just out of dental school, what I did is I went down to Pete Dawson, went to, you know, learned everything from Pete that I could, went to Mish, went through that whole program. It's more of a commitment financially, but boy, it's going to pay back in, it's going to pay back amazingly as your career goes. And as you learn better communication skills, now you get to do the work. So I would tell any young dentist, yes, it's a financial commitment, but it was a financial commitment to go to dental school. And you got to understand that, and you you just have to understand that what you were taught in dental school is about the base, most basic stuff that you have. I mean, how to do a crown, how to do a filling, and that's it. But you want to learn uh, truly about occlusion, truly about those things. Get get in one of those longer type courses, have six, seven levels, and go through that. And I think mm -hmm. I think what you'll find is those dentists become not only more confident in the dentistry they're doing. But confidence shows when you're talking to patients. They go, wow, they're very confident. Um, and dye your hair a little bit gray, too, if you're young. Just make yourself look a little bit. Older. What if you don't have any hair? So hey, I'm working on it. I'm working on it back here. So I'm doing it. Yeah, that's awesome. Now, when you're looking at what you had mentioned, proper marketing is another key, too. And that's that's like a that's a tough one for dentists. Would you agree? Like, explain that one. Well, the marketing... First of all, the average dentist that comes through Productive Dentist Academy markets at about, oh, I think, 1.4% of their revenue. I mean, no business, there's no businesses out there besides dentistry that market so little and expect so much. I mean, you know, phone companies, I mean, all this stuff, they, they spend a significant amount of, amount of money. What we recommend is an 8% marketing budget. But how does that work? Well, if you look at my... We'll, we'll look at a combination of two overhead items. One would be the average guy comes in is like 1.7, 1.4, 1.7%. Their, their team overhead is uh, close to 30, 30%, 30 28, 29. Well, let's just say 28 and it's two. They're at 30% overhead for those two items. My team overhead is 17.5%. I've got an 8% marketing budget. I'm at 25.5%. They're at 30% of their overhead, but I'm penetrating the market at an 8% rate, and they're penetrating the market at a 1.6. Plus, all fixed expenses are driven down, including the cost of my building. Everything else is driven down. So the more I market, the more money I make, and the lower my overhead goes. It's hard to, it, it, it's hard to grasp that as a dentist sits there and he goes, man, you mean if I spend more money on marketing, I can actually drive all my other costs down to offset that? Yeah, you do. But they'd rather sign up for maybe a PPO that offers a 30 to 40% discount on their fees 
by doing that, it just absolutely kills you because now you're going to have to work at least 400% harder to make the same dollar that you were going to make. So, and I'm not saying, I mean, there's a lot of good ones, I'm sure, and everything else, but my, my way is I want fee-for-service people. Uh, who needs the dentistry right now? People over 55. And uh, who has the most money? <clears throat> people over 55. You know, so if you're going to a coist or going to a spear, going to one of these courses, you need patients that need you and need your your services and what you've learned to do. So I market to them. I tell them, hey, come on in. And I, I educate them through our marketing. I call it educational marketing. I, I'm not going to two for one happy hour on Friday, or, you know, or we're having the blue light special on Wednesday. I don't do any of that. I just tell them, come see us. We do, you know, we do implants. We do you know, pretty much everything. So, and that's the way we work with guys. We up, upsell, upsell their marketing that the hard part is we would for a long time, PDA, we didn't have a marketing company. We would send to our buddies and we believe in a budget. So we would say 8%. So if you're, if the previous month you did a hundred grand in collections, then 8% would be 8,000 for this month. So we would send them to our buddies out there we know all the names of marketing companies and they would upsell them to some hundred thousand dollar marketing plan that totally blew their budget. And I was like, we sent them to you. I actually sent them to you with a budget in mind and you upsold them to some thing that they don't need. What we do is work within a budget and say, let's get your 8%. Let's do it. And as you grow, guess what? Your marketing budget goes up. So if you're at 50,000, you're doing 4,000. Now you're doing a hundred thousand. You're at eight. Now you're at 150,000. You're at 12. My marketing budget is, you know, 35,000 a month in a town of 6,000 people. So I could have every billboard in town if I wanted. I could have, you know, which is definitely not something I would do, but I could do whatever I want as far as marketing because I have the revenue to do it. And so I can reach out on radio. I could do, I don't do TV, but we do radio. I've got a face for Face for radio, so it's that's what I like to do, and uh, and that's why our average patient comes from like seventy miles away. I mean, we're we literally people come from all over North Texas uh, to come to us because they've been hearing about us for the last thirteen years, and they go, man, you know, I need to go down and see those guys. Yeah. So that, that's what we do, and marketing plays a huge role with service mix, and and we kind of customize our marketing for our docs if they love doing. Serac or whatever it is, then we make them the Serac doc in that, in that area. Cause, or if it happens to be implants, I learned a lesson a long time ago. I had a good friend of mine. We were on a golf course. He comes up and he goes, Hey, do you like my teeth? And I was like, yeah, Kevin, I, I like them. What'd you do? He said, well, I got veneers done. I go, well, why didn't you come to me? He said, Oh, I thought you just did implants. Because I had been marketing for like three years, all implants, all, and I, I went, oh my gosh. And so I changed that, didn't do any implant marketing for a long time because I like doing everything, you know, whatever it is. And so I changed up that marketing to where it was, you know, some about cosmetic dentistry, same day smiles, teeth tomorrow, uh, you know, whatever it is. So I keep it fresh and keep it new as, as we go through uh, all of our marketing plans. And, and we have a budget, we, we run on, on that budget. And we grow and the business continues to grow. It's grown every year for 34 years and it keeps getting bigger. Um, and that's just fine with me. And so, yeah, uh, absolutely. And I love that. And when, until I can grow, let's say I'm a young dentist and I, until I can grow to that percentage, what are you seeing any trends with younger dentists? Like where they could, cause they might not be able to start at that, but as they grow, what, what are you noticing? Yeah. You know, it, we don't, we're not going to go from zero to, you know, 80 miles an hour. You know, what we'll do is we'll step it up gradually. The better they get at communication skills, the less new patients they need. You know, it's, it's interesting. Yeah. I got people that are coming in to PDA that are seeing 150 new patients a month and they're doing $400 an hour. And I'm going, well, you know, okay, you're doing 400 an hour, you're seeing 100 patients that means that probably 90 percent of these people aren't doing the work or they're you know they're, they're, you're not or you're just doing a single crown each time so it's uh it's hard to hard to say but from from that perspective dentists you know will work them up you know maybe they start out at one and a half percent two percent then they go to three or four then they go to five and they begin to grow their marketing budget as they start to eliminate maybe some of their less less uh some of their worst PPOs that they're in. They might get rid of this one. Now I'm marketing. I'm starting to get more, I'm starting to get more, uh, 
you know, more patients that need the work I need to have done. So, and we'll work them up gradually. It's not an overnight thing. Usually over a period of about 18 months, we'll have them up to 8%. They will have eliminated probably 50% of the PPOs that they're with. Uh, they're actually working, uh, being productive at a rate. Now they're doing say, uh, instead of doing 400 an hour, 350, now they're doing 650, 700. They have choices now. They've got an extra 500 grand coming in. So these are all things that we work with to try to help help the doc get into a less stressful, more productive uh, office where they're not running behind, where you're enjoying what you do. Because uh, I went through 10 years of not enjoying it. And I wanted to be a dentist from the time I was eight years old. But after being in the service, I loved it. I mean, I was in there for four years. I, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed dentistry. I get in private practice. It was a nightmare for about five years. I didn't know what I was doing. It was a lot of stress, and uh, and it, it it's so much better to enjoy what you do, and it's not like working anymore. Uh, and, and we can help docs do that. And that's that to me is kind of a, I mean that that's what that's what makes me happy. You know, if we can yeah. help do that. So absolutely, I got a good. Question from our good friend Deepak who watches the show. He said, how many hours per week should a young dentist spend on non-dental, contemplative, strategic business and managerial thinking? What's your thoughts? Well, I can only tell you what I did. And, uh, you know, I was spending probably every waking hour thinking about the business, thinking about all this, you know, everything from, you know, evenings, you know, coming home, writing notes, trying to find out you know, how, what kind of practice that I want to have. That's where coaches can really help you. You think, well, that's a lot of money to spend on a coach. I had nine different coaches over, over 30 years. And why? Because I want a separate set of eyes helping me. And there's a lot of good stuff now, but not only with podcasts, but with webinars, with uh, all different kinds of stuff. There's all kinds of opportunity out there. So take it and learn, you know, learn from those things. But I would say, I was probably spending 16 hours a week on business, uh, and I was working five. So figure that out. You know, it's probably seven days a week. You know, and and that's just the way it was for probably seven or eight years until mm-hmm. I finally kind of started to understand about how to communicate better. You know, how do I how do I get people to say yes? Because it's really not about massive numbers of new patients. It's really about just marketing to people that need the services that you want to provide. And then, uh, and then doing it and communicating with them. And if they like you, they're going to do it. If they don't like you, if you're like the boring doctor that walks in, doesn't smile, says open up, you know, you can expect what you get. I mean, you're, you're, you know, that's just, you're never going to change. So I'm constantly changing. I'm constantly trying to find new ways of doing it. But to answer that question, I I would spend six, probably 16 hours a week or more, uh, just writing notes. I'm somebody, I've got ADD so bad I can you know, go all over the place, but I have to have statistics. I have to have metrics. If I don't have the metrics, I- I'm lost and that's not a good feeling. And so even from when we first started the practice back in 1985, I wanted to know every detail about how much do we produce per operatory? How much do we do, you know, per hour? How, what What is our collection ratios and all, you know, all that stuff. I had to know it at the drop of a hat. And that was kind of before computers were, you know, were hot. So it was all done by hand. And today, you can get a lot of data, whether it's with a company like Dental Intel, you can get tons of dashboards and everything else. So you have a, it's a little easier now, I think, to be able to evaluate your practice by using technology. And, uh, and we do that when we use, we use all those things. So, yeah, yeah, that's awesome. That is awesome. I love the way you think on that because with the data now, it, it just calms everybody. You now, it's unemotional. You can start to make really, really good decisions. And I find I'm constantly wrong. I'm like, oh my goodness, I thought that would be better than that. Or I thought I didn't realize that would work as well. So it's it's pretty cool. Now, on the, uh, on the strategic thinking side of things, which leads us to key number four is you know, I'm thinking about this as you say this, Bruce, but I'm looking at my schedule. I'm like, how, how do we do this? And that's really key. Number four is you got to schedule properly in this whole thing. So take us through that because that's the, that's one of the, well, they're all not easy, but this is one of the hard ones. It is. And, uh, I will tell you, uh, scheduling to productivity, not to time. I don't think there's anybody out there that teaches that, but except for us, but, um, I don't schedule, uh, based on, how long it takes me to do something, which people go, what, what we do is we teach guys to 
everybody knows about block scheduling. You know, there, there's 10 different rules or whatever. I don't pay any attention to it. But what I do is if I've got three crowns that need to be done, and let's just say uh, that's $3,000, and my goal is 500 an hour, mm -hmm. then how long do I book for, for that? If, I, if it's my goal, 500 an hour, and I've got $3,000 worth of dentistry, how long do I schedule for it? And I'll ask the docs in the audience, they go, three crowns, it'll take me about 40 minutes or an hour or an hour and a half. And I go, yeah, that's, that's right. How, how long are you going to book? They go, well, I'm going to book about an hour and a half. I go, oh, okay. No, how do we do it? I would book six hours. Now, people go, what? That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. No, I book six hours. I, I work out of three chairs uh, doing, doing operative dentistry. But that one chair now is six hours booked at 500 an hour. So mm -hmm. that's my goal, 500 an hour. All I got to do is find one more, you know, $1,000 to, to put in my schedule. And I can, so I'm not running behind. And it's, it's totally counterintuitive for most people. It takes a while to get it. But mm -hmm. once you get it, who's responsible for my schedule? I've got Gay responsible for chair one. I've got Summer responsible for chair two. Shannon responsible for chair three. Nothing gets put in that schedule from the front desk. Now, that sounds crazy. They do put stuff in there, but they send a little instant message and saying, hey, Summer, I just put this patient in. And I wanted to make sure it was okay. I told them I would call them back and change it. Or if you need to call it back and change it, if you don't have enough time. Mm -hmm. So we have actually trained our front to communicate with the back to make sure that that schedule, my team knows if I'm doing three root canals, which I hate root canals, but if I'm doing three root canals, there's not a lot of other stuff I can do. I'm going to be sitting there and I can't go anywhere. And uh, so what I like to do is if I have an implant case, that's $8,000 for four implants, it's going to take me an hour to do it. How long do I book that chair for? All day. If my goal is a thousand, I just book it all day. Mm -hmm. That chair is now complete, and my goal for the day is complete. Pe people will say, "Well, what about you know, what if I had a three-unit bridge come in this afternoon? You know, it's, it's Friday afternoon. They need a three-unit bridge, and I'm looking at them. I'm like, and they, I'm ready to do it right now. Mm -hmm. And I said, "When do you do it?" And every dentist in the room says the same thing: "I do it right now." You know, if, if they're ready to do it, and they got the money because they may not come back. I don't do that. Because that, that would stress my team out, stress me out. I've already made my goal for that day. Mm -hmm. I'm on goal for that day. Uh, I'll look at Monday. I'm on goal for Monday. I look at Tuesday. Hey, I'm not on goal that day. And I'll say, hey, Kirk, can you? I, I want to make sure we have plenty of time. Can you come in on Tuesday at like 9 o'clock? They'll go, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, in I'm in town. I go, okay, well, let's do it then. So I'll move it to where I need it to keep my consistent production there. Mm -hmm. uh, now, what if I'm, what if I'm up, up to goal? Like there are months that I start the month and I'm already on goal for the month. I already have everything booked. So I've got X amount of dollars on the, on the books. I'll do it today. You know, I'll, I'll sit down, do the three, you know, it doesn't take that long to do. I just do it today, but I don't want to have a great day one day and a lousy day the next. It's right. just stressful. And uh, so scheduling to productivity is very different. X's and slashes is what we've all been taught. Mm -hmm. Nothing changed. And the X's are doctor's time. And in Dentrix ideal scheduling, it would be XXX, XXX, XXX. And this is the perfect day scheduling so that you not can't be in two places at one time. Well, that's the most least productive way of doing dentistry. Why? Because you're you're doing a number 19 and you're doing a DOL or something, and all of a sudden, up oh, there's a pulp horn. Oh, it looks like we're gonna do endo. Now you're doing endo. When are you going to do the end of right now? Now you're running behind. Now you have three hygienists standing outside your door waiting to come get a check. Uh, their patients are behind. Your patients are behind. When do you catch up at lunch? So you work through lunch. You finally catch up. And then you start over in the afternoon and the same thing happens again. Oh, something came up. Oh, can we just, can we do three teeth today? Oh, yeah, we can. I mean, dentists are they'd almost rather be non-productive uh, from a stress standpoint. Like, oh, yeah, I don't know if I, if we can do three today. Yeah, I'm do it. But it's all about, it's, you know, it's all about scheduling and mm -hmm. not running late for lunch, not running late at the end of the day, not having patients wait, not having hygiene patients wait. Cause when you got people out in the waiting room, 
you know, they're all waiting for 30 minutes, 40 minutes. Pretty soon they start talking and they're upset. And now you're dealing with those issues. I call those training opportunities. And every time I have a training opportunity, I want to solve that issue, whatever it is. So, uh, but scheduling is a, is, is paramount. It's, it's probably you know, short of communication, but if you can communicate all day long, but if you schedule poorly, you're going to be running behind and yeah. It just breaks down. The whole thing breaks down. Yeah. And so just so I heard this right. So you have those three ops. Each person, uh, you have a team member that's responsible for that op all day long. And they have a good sense of what you can manage. Now, here's the natural question that a dentist, like, Bruce, what do I do with hygiene? You know, how many hygienists? Like, because you know that question. You get that question yeah. all the time, right? Yeah. I do. We're doing an over-the-shoulder course in my office on Monday and Tuesday this next week. And people are amazed because... I mean, we're checking some days we're checking five hygienists or four hygienists and I have plenty of time. If I booked three hours to do something that only takes me 45 minutes, but it's at my goal, whatever it is, my goal is close to 3000 an hour. So now I've got time to go check hygiene. I'm, in fact, I'm usually, they bring me a little slip of paper at the beginning of hygiene and they say, all the risk factors are here. Yes, they wear a night guard. Are they wearing it? Yes. Da, da, da. And so I, I say, I'll be there and just set. And as soon as I get a break, I've got plenty of time to do the work I'm doing. And I go check my hygiene. And, and when I check hygiene, the understanding is all of my patients have had a comprehensive exam. So when I go in, they've already been diagnosed. So I'm not going in with an explorer going, okay, uh, let, me, let me see how the hygienist did on her cleaning. I, my hygienists are... That's their, that's their job. They're great at it. And I, mean, I don't check and see if all the calculus is gone or anything. I come in and I, I go into the relationship mode with the patient. How you been? Good to see you. How's Bob? How are the kids? Da, da, da. Then I say, let's take a look. I look at their x-rays. I take a mirror and look in the mouth. Mm -hmm. my, my hygiene exam is one minute or two minutes. But a minute and a half of that is me high-fiving the patient and rebuilding the relationship that I may not have seen him in a year. And so that's really what we do. So it doesn't take me long to check hygiene because they've all been diagnosed in treatment plan. I call that the hygiene annuity. It's uh, it's just sitting there. All this dentistry that needs to be done is just sitting there waiting to be done. And so when I go into hygiene, what if we have openings tomorrow in the schedule? I look at it and I go, my favorite deal. Hey, Kurt, it's time. These things, we've been watching them now for four years. It's time. You need to get it done. And as soon as you can and no pressure, but I mean, you really do. People will say, well, that seems kind of weird. You're just telling them they need to have it done when you need it on your schedule. Now I told them it needed to be done four years ago. You know, now I'm just communicating with them saying, Hey, it is time. So I'm able to take stuff out of hygiene easily and increase my productivity for the next day or fill the schedule for the next day. My team is very attuned to the goal of the day. And then the three chairs, just what you said is, is exactly right. They know how I work. The front desk doesn't. And so the schedule, I never hear gay. Well, I hear it, but I don't listen to it when they go, <laughs> well, I don't know who put that in here. I go, well, that's, 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 that's your problem, not mine. Mm -hmm. Because you should be looking at that schedule and you should know who put that in there. And our front office communicates with the back by telling them, hey, I just put this patient in. Is that okay? And if we need to change it, we'll change it. Uh, but we're t telling the patient, that I'm going to put you in at this time at two o'clock. Now, if if Doctor Baird needs more time, I'll get, I'll get, I'll call you back, and we'll find another time. Okay, good. And so the team works together. It's it's a it's a well oiled machine. And when people watch me, you know, on Monday and Tuesday producing twenty five or thirty thousand dollars a day, they go, How in the heck are you doing that? I'm not rushed. I will not run behind on Monday or Tuesday. I will be done by five o'clock and, uh, that's, it's a much, much better way of practicing dentistry when you're not stressed out. And what you find is you're able to actually have more fun mm -hmm. have relationships, have more time to talk to patients. So it's, uh, but it's about, you know, it's about communication, you know, marketing service mix and scheduling is the, is the big deal.
So. Yeah. And Bruce, yeah. I am so grateful. I know you're a, a busy, I should use not busy, but productive, man. You've got a lot going on. And for you to carve out an hour and just spend it with us, I'm so grateful. I know you got to run here in just a second. But like if people are watching this and I know they're going to want to reach out to you, learn a little bit more, how can we, and keep in mind, people are listening to this on iTunes. How can I find out more about you, what you do, and some of that information? Um, go to You can go to Productive Dentist Academy, uh, ProductiveDentist.com. Uh, go on the website. Uh, it has all the phone numbers, everything else you can call. You talk to Chris Moriarty. He'll do a, uh, they do a free practice assessment to kind of find out how can we help your business. There are some, some guys, I mean, we refer, we have a quite a group of people that we refer to. I mean, if it's somebody who's doing startup DSOs, I've got guys that do that stuff. I don't do that. I teach productivity, you know, so we, we kind of find out, is this, is this going to fit for you? And if it does, then that's great. But we have our own marketing department. We have our consultants around the country. And so we can, we can customize. I, I don't believe in uh, a cookie cutter approach. I, I like the fact that we have different coaches with different skills and different skill sets, they know the front desk, they know the back, they know hygiene. And, you know, so we, we work independently with those docs. So if anybody wants to know, I would go to ProductiveDentist.com. I've got another company called Compassionate Finance, which uh, you can go on there and find out information, CompassionateFinance.com. It's, uh, you know, it's another new way of, of getting patients to say yes to treatment. So, uh, yeah. but I'd love to hear from them. Yeah, and I'd love to have you back again and talk about that whole finance side of things because I know you developed this company and we, we've had a lot of our dentists that we know use it and they love it. So, and we can talk about the concepts behind it and why it works too. Yeah, so, I'd love to. Yeah. Do it. I'd love yeah. to. Yeah. Well, buddy, I'm, I'm so grateful we went over the time I promised you, but Thanks. there's just a ton of information here. I got a lot of notes and uh, just, so, just stick around while we say goodbye to everybody else. Um, but thank you guys for watching. I hope you enjoyed today. If you did, just do us a favor, hit the share button, share with your friends. Continue to add questions to the feed. If there's things that you'd love to hear from Bruce uh, and different topics, add them or send them, send us a note. We'll get them back, and I'll ask him all the questions that you guys want to know about. But until we see you next time, keep watching the best practices show. You guys enjoy the rest of your day. Mm -hmm.